Welcome to School of Data. My name is Karsten Rodin. I'm an urban designer with the Department of City Planning here in New York. I'm really excited to have a chance to share some of what I work on at the intersection of spatial data and drawing. Just before we get started, welcome. So what I'm going to talk about today is oriented toward two things. One is the goal that School of Data has of helping empower people to neighborhoods. I'm like hopeful that this can be a little piece of this bigger project I work on that's about democratizing digital drawing tools and giving more people ways to draw and model the spaces that we inhabit in order to be able to have conversations about those things more successfully. Another goal is just like for people that maybe aren't in the planning architecture design space, I'm thinking that this a little bit of maybe like almost an outsider perspective or alternate alternative perspective on kind of what it means to work with data from the perspective of a designer or an urban designer specific. And we're going to kind of cover a couple of things, but right off the bat, I'm going to talk just a little bit about what urban design practice at, at city planning is about, what we work on. I'm going to zoom in a little bit to like our relationship with data and the way that we work. Uh, I'm going to talk about the like our humble contribution to the open data landscape, which is this thing called the New York 3D model and share some updates on that. And then the back half of this is going to be a sort of like outline or roadmap of some like techniques and approaches for drawing New York City streets with an open source software called Blender. And the original intent of the talk was to try to do that as a like tutorial where it's like an actual like how to but because of the time constraints and the way the scheduling worked out it's gonna this is gonna end up being a more like a just glossing over like a couple of different features that are in there that people can use but that's that's gonna serve as like a model for a series of tutorials I'm hoping to work on like over the next couple of months that are gonna come out gradually in order to support this goal of like I was saying democratizing the like the data-driven drawing process so so just to kick off, the urban design division at city planning, where I work, just to talk about what that, what our, our office is charged with. We're like broadly focused on advocating for quality design in the built environment. It's a, it's a pretty broad umbrella. So it covers a lot of, a bunch of different scales. So it's everything from new street furniture to proposals for new buildings to like neighborhood plans that are at that scale. And then also important to flag that we work between both the formal land use land use review process and are involved in the review of like specific applications for projects, but also um, do a fair amount of like indirect influence and trying to put out publicly accessible resources and contribute to the state of urban design in the city through tools and guidelines and that thing. Yeah. So we like do a lot of drawing where we work. We talk a lot with different like agency partners and stakeholders. And then a big part of our work is also we're the go-to group when it comes to doing community workshops that are about proposals that affect the built environment. And so we really in that work, especially tend to ample use of like hand drawing and sketching and model making in order to communicate more vividly and effectively with the publics that we serve about that. So moving on to, I'm going to shut this down, but this is just one of a million ways that you could define this. But for me, it's really about this like situation that we're in with groups of people where our role is really to guide and facilitate these conversations that bring together like a bunch of different interests, working through problems as a group over time. And there's a like the kind of key thing that we do as designers is we really bring like visual media and graphic tools into that environment to help facilitate those conversations to make sure things are getting communicated clearly to like document and write things down. So the central role of drawings and the work that we do is like things Thing that I wanted to flag. And so as we're having those conversations, as we're moving through the design process and this process of having conversations with people, data in, in a bunch of different forms like shows up along that journey. So we have like regular old boring tabular data comes into the mix. We work with spatial data, do different kinds of GIS based analyses. There's data in the version where it's like pieces of CAD drawing. So this idea of CAD blocks that some of you guys might be familiar with from the architecture world. It's like the notion that you can have like recyclable elements of drawings that you can like use and reuse and recycle in different contexts over time. Um, people who work in the full on architecture world use building information modeling, which is really complicated, data rich models of building scale spaces. We don't really do that quite as much, but that's like just a thing to note. And then there's stuff that's like veers toward the qualitative and like maybe isn't in the form that we normally think of when we think of data especially from this computational angle that we're like coming at it here, but, but just these like reference materials that we use. So I mentioned the design guidelines that we put out. There's like things like architectural graphic standards, these like desk references where you might just be like in an old school way, just like looking up things. 
information. And then the last thing on the list is, I think Comptroller Lander mentioned this in the introduction today, but the notion that the lived experiences of people and the local knowledge that people have about the neighborhoods that they live in and work in, that's something that we're trying to grapple with lately and think about ways that we can understand that potentially as like a form of data or information to reckon with in the design process. So just like in a nutshell, thinking about this space of the drawing as this is where we work, this is how we work, we do these visual things, we like use that to communicate, we use that to record decisions. And as we develop those drawings along that along that pathway, that's there's like multiple ways and like multiple forms where data comes into that. And moving on to like what I work on, this this product that we offer, this like our contribution to the open data story is this thing called the New York City 3D model, which is like mostly oriented toward that like reference material side of things, so giving an easy way to just if you're a person who spends all their time inside of 3D modeling software, this gives you an easy way to just get your hands on all of the currently available geometric spatial data that like can speak to the like physical characteristics of the place that you're working on in some way. And so this, as of today, this aggregates 30 plus data sets into one thing. Among those are the, there's a kind of unfortunately aged 3D buildings data set from Do It Now. There's Map Pluto, which city planning does an awesome job of keeping really up to date. There's the street tree census, elevation data. There's a whole bunch of different things in there. And again, this is like Really the audience of this is people who like work in these 3D modeling softwares that are like the predominant way that professional designers draw in a day-to-day -day way. And it's just focused on the geometry of things in the physical city. So it's not really addressing demographics at all. So this is a graphic representation of some of the things that are in there. So I mentioned buildings, tax lot, um, but there's also weirder stuff. There's a data set of like where all the swimming pools are in the city that's available interested to to make a drawing of that so yeah so that like that's been around since about 2018 and the old version of this was a file-based download and so my predecessor and a couple of interns invested a considerable amount of time and energy and in, like individually downloading each one of these shape files and file geo databases importing that into Rhino, converting that all, putting it into individual layers. And, and the result was this file-based model by community district that's, uh, that's still available. You can get that on the city planning website or through open data. But more recently, we've also been experimenting with ways to provide like on-demand downloader that can either give that to you as a Rhino file, or it can also produce a Collada file, which is something that is, you can work with that inside of SketchUp, 3D Max, Maya, and Blender, which we're going to look Today. So this is the file-based version, city planning website. As I said, these are like organized by community districts. You have to download the entire neighborhood. And one of the drawbacks of this or feedback that we get on this a lot is that these files are super huge. Some of them are like almost a gigabyte when you unzip them. So in, in a lot of cases, this is like almost not usable for most people. Yeah, so the on-demand downloader of this is, is meant to be like easier to use. It's right now it's mostly just functional like on the level of if you're working like on an individual block or a couple of blocks. But how this works is you can navigate to a specific piece of the city that you're interested in and you can cut out the area that you're working on and then you make your choice of whether you want it as Rhino or Collada. Click download and that makes a bunch of queries to the spatial database that has all that stuff in it and gives you your file back to work with. So yeah, and so that's people who haven't been through this process before might be like, oh, okay, cool. That's not that big of a deal. But normally when you do this to get like each one of these things, you like you have to go find that on open data as like a separate, a separate download and piece together like each individual layer and it can take a lot of time. Yeah. So let's switch over to the blender side. And I'm just gonna walk through, I'll open that up. We'll look at what's inside of there, what that gives you, and then I'll show like like I said, at a high level, some of the things that it's possible to like do with this. So I'll start out just in this empty layer here. I'll import that file that we just downloaded. And you can see this has got the 3D building meshes. It's got the roadbeds, tax lots, all the things that I mentioned came in wrong but and they're all grouped and organized by like the layers that you want them on to be able to like do script-based workflows and be able to toggle them on and off and that kind of thing but yeah so this is like in its raw form again like this is just whatever geometry is available with those shape files with those file geo databases as they come in thinking back to this higher level like view of what we work on as urban designers, the there, there's often like a need to use this for, for visualization or for more than just getting your hands on the data. So for the rest of this, trying to keep my eye on time just so I have a sense of what's going on. I'm just gonna walk through 
a couple of ways that like we've been working on to to kind of make use of this as a visualization tool and to a limited extent, a way of doing analysis on things like shadows and stuff like that. So I'm going to ditch that thing that I just downloaded and I'm going to start out with a, this is a, another site that I pre-cooked a little bit. We can think of this as like a cooking show. This is like one that was already in the oven or something. And so same deal. This one has a little bit of a bonus where there's one, one of the things that this can do now that it wasn't doing previously is to cook this like ground mesh that's based on the, um, the digital elevation rasters. And that's something that's a little bit more like heavy to compute. So that's not turned on in the public facing thing yet, but that's going to give us a starting point for working on this model. The first thing we'll do here is we'll look, we'll think about trying to make a perspectival drawing of a street level view of this place. So I've set up a camera here looking up this street. This is one that I picked because it has cool topography and can show off that, like what's going on with the ground mesh. And we can see that like at the beginning of this doesn't look that great. So we have a ground mesh that like when we're looking at it from the sky, it shows what that topography looks like. The buildings are there, but this doesn't look really anything like the street actually looks. There's like these weird like pockets or holes like in front of the buildings. The buildings are all gray. So we need to do a bunch of work to get this looking a little bit more relatable. So the first thing we'll do is work on the ground a little bit. And like I mentioned, the, this is, we can use this, sorry, oops. we can use that what it gives us as the like raw spatial data to, to manually clean that up and use like in Blender, there's like a way that you can smooth meshes and adjust things and that thing. So this is one that this has been cleaned up a little bit and you can see Unlike the original one, this has been um, not only smoothed out, but also like using those like roadbed layers that are in here. There's a technique where you can split the mesh with that and get everything carved up into the like separate streets and sidewalks. There's a technique that I'm hoping to cover in those tutorials about how to do things like curb cuts and like where to cut street tree pits and that kind of thing. Um, not the most exciting thing, but this is this gives us like a much just starting to look a lot better in terms of the actual geometry of the ground plane. But it still doesn't look, it still doesn't really look like much, right? Like it's still all gray. So the next step is to do our like scene lighting and rendering setup. One of the cool things about Blender is that it has a really good real-time rendering setup built in. So there's a like sky that's been thrown in here. There's like a sun, sun lamp that's been put in the scene. Another step we can take to make this look a little bit better is to put a, an environment texture in just to get the lighting looking a little bit better. So that's starting to look, that's starting to look okay. And so far, like all this has been, except for fetching that big set of spatial data sets that are coming in from a database. This has all been like manually worked, but there's a couple of different points in here where there's an opportunity to do some scripting or make a call to an API or something like that. That's going to kind of enhance the process a little bit. So one of the things that we can do with that model download service, another feature that thing provides is we have a little sun angle API included with that. There's a script in here where you can also set like a date and a time of day and that'll set the angle of the shadows for you if you want. This is if you're used to working in Rhino or whatever, this is something that like that can do out of the box, but but it's in Blender, it's not quite there yet. I can just as an example, like change that time a little bit and run that. And that's going to make a call to that service and adjust adjust the rendering that we have here. That's pretty cool. So yeah, and then next step, we can think about ways to get the stuff in the scene looking a little bit better. I showed already getting the ground mesh cleaned up. You can go a little bit farther and I start to apply like actually like materials and textures to that roadbed. This is something that like once you have that chopped up into the roads and sidewalks, it's like relatively easy to do. And then same thing with the buildings as well. So this is something that like turn those off and then turn these on. So it's starting to look a little bit more vivid and with the different shades of brick or whatever you might see out on New York City street. So yeah, and so at that point, then it really starts to be about what kinds of things can you like add to this to start to really bring this alive and give it a sense of scale. And aside from things like the crosswalk stripes that we've got in there, help people see things that are a little bit more recognizable. So one thing that we can do, like starting out with things that we just might draw by hand is add things like trees. So these are like this is a semi-manual process where one of the things that we have in this is the like point locations of the street trees from the street tree census. Like using that, you can start to draw the um, your best guess at what might be there. But that's drawing things manually is a, is often a pretty time-consuming thing. Another thing that like you can really do to speed this along and make this maybe a little bit more um, pragmatic in a kind of work environment, maybe where you're having to produce renderings like this under a lot of time pressure 
is to use this. It's actually a really new feature in Blender called the Asset Browser, which lets you recycle and reuse like pieces of models, like in the same way that I mentioned with like with CAD blocks earlier on. This is just a couple of things in here, but I just I threw in some street lamps, some cars, thinking about maybe we block the street off to have some block party here. And placing these assets is super simple. Like you can, you're basically given this drawer of all of the different models that you put in your catalog and you can like drag and drop these onto different surfaces that are in there. And this is cool because it'll detect what you're putting it on and it makes it really easy to like populate things like street scenes and put like facade elements on buildings and that kind of thing. So yeah, so moving on, another thing that you can do is uh, thinking about how like how data and scripting can contribute to this is that there's a feature in here called geometry nodes now that if you're familiar with like grasshopper in the Rhino world, this is a way that you can use visual programming paradigm to tell Blender to draw stuff along curves and like populate meshes with stuff like that. So this is a strung along a curve that like runs from like lamppost to tree to lamppost and so on, like up the street. And that's getting used to like put these like flags along here and like kind of color that that way. And then you can also use that to do stuff like put like facade elements on buildings. And so that's getting used to like rig these all up. And then if I turn on in this, uh, shoot, where did it go? In the, uh, the building mesh itself, you can use that to knock out the, the pieces of the facade that are behind the windows and that kind of thing. So that's pretty much it as far as like the Blender stuff. The last thing that's on here, thinking especially about this workshop environment that we're often in is this, yeah, I mentioned that we make a lot of use of like hand sketching and like going out to communities and like having a drawing on a table and like just drawing things with people like that. And Blender has this really amazing, oops, there's this feature in here called the grease pencil that lets you draw either like on the picture plane as you're working from a view or like on surfaces. And there's nothing like too fancy in here, but you can see there's like a little bit of scribbling like on this building and in the middle of the street here. I and mean, you can use this to like super easily just mark up and annotate stuff that's going on there. So yeah, so that's it on the Blender side. Like I mentioned, the so that's just a like high level overview of some of the things that it's like possible to do with this. And then where I wanted to end is like thinking about things that like you might want to do next or didn't quite make it into the talk is really big one is like thinking about who goes into the rendering. People might be familiar with this like narrative of a couple of years ago, a lot of people were using this Swedish website called Skolgabar to get these cut out people to put into their architecture renderings. And there's like a big backlash against this because if you scroll through this, this being a Swedish website, but something that's globally famous and used like by architects and architecture students all around the world, you start to end up with renderings that are just full of, full of people who look like they're from Sweden. And you're like, when you're using that to illustrate drawings that are talking about a place that doesn't have people like that look like that living there, that ends up being a way that you're erasing who's actually there. A couple of different projects that I just wanted to bring to this to talk about. One is this one, Non-Scandinavia, that emerged shortly after that. But then there's also some that are like a little bit more oriented toward this like digital drawing and 3D modeling space that I'm talking about. So one is this project called Peopling Studio, where you can get either Blender or a 3D Max files of people that are drawn from drawn from real life and some of the places that are not as well represented there. And then another one that I think is really cool is this project by a group called Dash Marshall that this actually is like a, a web app that like pulls census data and gives you like a collection of scale figure cutouts that are supposed to be demographically representative of the place that you put in there. Just another way to think about the uses of data and the design process and how that finds its way into the drawing. At the, at the end. And then the last thing is we've talked a lot about the role that the drawing plays in like communicating things with people, like what it can do like during the design process as a like way to have a conversation. One of the things that's cool about focusing in on like some of the digital drawing tools that are here is that it's really easy to put those things out in front of people through public digital media. So one side of that is like web-based stuff, things like, I really like this project that the, an artist did at the Library of Congress last summer called Speculative Annotation that um, lets people go into a room together and look at something from the Library of Congress collection and draw on something that they're looking at together and have a conversation around this like piece of visual media that's on the table. So you can start to imagine ways that we might use a 3D model of the street scene in a similar way. And then there's also the other, there's like the, emerging genre of the interactive documentary, setting up a model or a sort of digital drawing so that it's sequenced and has like things like photography and video and the narrative that goes with it. So this is one that I really like that's 
not super relevant to like the urban environment, but this is like following, um, oh shoot, a lot of like title credit I guess. So this is like similar idea where you're using, it's structured around this 3D model of a place that's linked with, with spatial data. It's pulling from a spatial data stuff about this park that they're looking at in Canada and it follows the lives of these like animals that live in this place. And I think the story here has to do with the wildlife that lives here is like they're up against the built environment in a close way. And so it's talking about those various ways I'm in contact with them. It's cool. So anyway, so that's that. Yeah, looks like I did okay on time. I don't know if people have questions or like things they want to talk about, but I just wanted to kind of end on this. If you're interested to kind of get in touch with the urban design division, then you can visit us online or email this address. And I'm going to be doing the Gwendy in a personal way because it's connected with you. So if you're interested in that stuff, you as well. But yeah, happy to take any questions or anything you have. Yeah, what's up? What kind of decisions do you, does your department help inform? So one of the main ones is I mentioned this way that we work between there's like a set of like formal responsibilities we have putting up informally in that formal process. What that is urban designers that work in the borough offices of city planning or put in this role of when an app, when a private applicant is coming, the discretionary land use process, basically trying to get a variance for something like that, that negotiation that happens around what are we going to give them in terms of like additional rights or like leeway on like the rules in exchange for what like that conversation not transactional necessarily but there's a give and take there and it starts to be really important in those conversations to have visual media that represent the surrounding conditions of the site and especially thinking about what architects tend to be responsible for relative to what that conversation touches on they usually come with a pretty robust set of documents that describe the like building that they're working on, but not necessarily the like context that it sits within. And so this is something that we're really hopeful can bridge the gap between how that like proposal for a new building is drawn and represented and the ways that we have of understanding the context, which would otherwise, yeah. Uh -huh. It's a great question. Yeah, so we get asked that all the time. So this is the specific data set that is, is this one from Do It. And this is, it was like a one-time capture that they produced through, I'm forgetting the name of the technique, but it's basically from that oblique aerial imagery that you see sometimes, like Bing Maps used to use it. And so most of the buildings that are in here, like what's happening is someone is like reviewing like an image of each individual building and they're making like an extreme, just to the sort of visual point that they're like deciding like that looks like it's coming starts. And so... This one especially is like really not super precise because it's not measured from like directly from at all. It's like a second product of this like aerial imagery product. So yeah, it's definitely not intent, like not really intended to be used as something that like gives the exact dimensions of things. And if you look at in the model that like you can download from, even the sort of horizontal positions of buildings don't align in a very good way. So you'll get cases where there's three foot like overlap building volumes stuff like that. And so it's really, I'm talking about design broadly, but one thing that's really important to flag on this is that the requirements for accuracy we have as, as urban designers and people that are mostly focused on this conversational, like illustrative mode of thinking about like the built environment at the scale of a block, those requirements are really different from people that work, need to work with. I think, let's see, let's go you first. The, 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 uh... Oh man, there's so many things. A, big, a really big one. So the, this data set is, this is almost 10 years old now. So I just, the other day was like looking at a site that was like near my neighborhood and there was like in the model, there's like a big pit where there's now like a building that's been there for five. Uh, just having like regular updated buildings is like, but I would also be really excited to have access to ground level LIDAR. There's a, one of the things that could make this really cool is having like better data about placements of like specific street furniture and stuff actually in this like bodily scale register of what we experience on the sidewalk. There's really not very good data about that right now. So if we had something that could start to speak to that. Earlier, uh, uh, it's, like, how do you, like, it's a great question. It's, it's really tricky. And I think like one of the big challenges is that in that process, the people that are like applying for permission, like they're going to be really well represented because they have the ability of different professionals, like design professionals, like 
zoning and these people that can come to that one. And there's there's like an ideal world where really us as like public servants and represent like the public good in general should be able to be in a position of advocating like back on on people's behalf. But one of the things that's missing there is it is the like, reliable and like mutually trusting like channel of communication in terms of what people's interests actually are and like what they want in a neighborhood. That's one of the places where you know, thinking about this like situation of like a workshop practice that I met, starting to really try to find ways to like take the like lived experiences of residents seriously as something that can count as a data set and that we can keep tabs on even beyond the scope of a project to just have an understanding of what, what's going people want. That's something that we don't really have totally figured out yet, but there is some really exciting work having engagement. I think you had a final question. Yeah, I guess I'm like you really. I thought it would be really cool for this data set to have it as a writing group in zone. That's real. Well, I think that's the developer group. This is what has a writing group in zone. This is our proposal, but the facility that we need to be in, let's have that conversation around what this is really. Uh huh. This will be our. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So you're saying like, I hear two, two things in there potentially. Like, one is like the ability to see kind of like under the rules, like what's actually allowed there, like what's the as of right. But then also you're saying kind of what if there was a way to see the actual development? I think about those images that you see on the construction fence, which are like David Ajay drew like a squid, like that's going to get, I don't even know what that, yeah, on that, I think like, I have no idea like what's like practical to like expect on this, but like, it'll be really interesting to see in the next couple of years, if the U.S. gets any farther along on like any like dim like mandates, like they have in the, in the U.K. there's like a, there's like you have a building information model go through the approval process and stuff like that we don't have anything like that now but if we were to have something like that and had that data set available everybody's model that they've submitted for every project like that's kind of from like a philosophical standpoint like what like for you in terms of voter representative set building like a representation for the public good and what are the things that are represented in the building like a representation tool that could allow us to see the city in a different way that's sort of at the same scale that we talk about with the uh -huh. survey express and mapping the use of figure ground and impact on our idea of like the same big idea that it's like to you. I think, yeah, that's a great question. I think my answer would be like, it would be something like an everybody map. So there's something in that title of the Noli map where that's getting credited to an individual author. And for me, the most exciting thing about starting to think about ways of drawing and modeling like around these like huge public data sets and like using things like databases and that workflows, it just, it creates these conditions for the possibility of a true collectively authored drawing or model of the environment that we live in. And really to push hard on that possibility of like, real, like we can draw this together and we can have these conversations together through drawing. I think I really appreciate all your questions. Um, thanks for coming out and uh, feel free to get in touch or come talk to me after.